My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. By the end of June 1940, the United Kingdom stood alone. France had surrendered and the British Expeditionary Force and her allies had just faced a humiliating retreat back across the Channel from the beaches of Dunkirk. Nazi Germany and her allies had succeeded in conquering the rest of Europe from Norway to Sicily. As both sides drew breath, Adolf Hitler, the German leader, ordered his military commanders to draw up plans to force a British surrender by whatever means possible, through blockade, bombing or even invasion. Ahead lay a long, hot summer as battle for national survival was fought in the skies over Britain, in full view of the population. Not only did their fate depend on the outcome of the battle, but also the freedom of the rest of Europe and ultimately the outcome of the Second World War. On September the 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, precipitating the Second World War. Tanks, infantry and aircraft attacked and overwhelmed traditional defences as a combined force to devastating results. It was a new tactic the Germans called Blitzkrieg. Poland fell in 28 days, despite heroic, even suicidal attempts to repel the invaders. Over the following months, Europe braced itself for Hitler's next move. Then, in April 1940, Germany invaded Denmark and Norway. On May the 10th, it was the turn of the Netherlands, Belgium and France to feel the full force of the Blitzkrieg. By June the 5th, the British expeditionary force that had gone to France in support of the French was facing annihilation on the beaches of Dunkirk. Despite constant bombardment and aerial attack, a fleet of small ships plucked the tattered remnants of the army off the beach. Although they had left all their heavy equipment behind, the exhausted men would form the nucleus of a new army that would lead the fight back when the time was right. The Royal Air Force had played its part during the months of the Phony War. Starting from a very weak point, the RAF had begun re-equipping its squadrons with new fighters and bombers. New pilots and crews were put into service as quickly as possible to guard against the assault that would surely come. Some 100 precious fighters and 80 irreplaceable pilots had been lost in the battle for France. But when all had seemed lost, nine of the ten squadrons that formed the fighter element of the advanced air striking force had been withdrawn in order to prepare for Britain's defence. 
But the early campaigns had also taken their toll on German forces. Her navy had been badly mauled during the invasion of Norway, leaving her with a greatly reduced surface fleet. Also, the Luftwaffe had sustained many losses of experienced air crews during the battle for France. And so, by the end of June, both sides needed time to recover and plan their next move. The Germans had begun planning for an invasion of Britain in late 1939. But there had been little real progress. Both the Navy and Air Force were against the idea. However, by July 1940, Hitler, frustrated by British refusal to negotiate an armistice, decided that invasion plans should now become a priority. Codenamed Operation Sea Lion, the invasion area was to cover from the Wash in the east to as far west as Dorset. Large coastal batteries were brought up to bombard the British coast, while barges to carry troops and armour were brought from the waterways all over Germany's conquered territories and assembled in French harbours, where they became targets for RAF Bomber Command. But Britain had a very large and powerful navy and a modern and rapidly expanding air force. In order to mount a successful invasion, Hitler knew that the Germans would need to control the skies. Only then could a heavy enough bombing campaign be mounted and an invasion force cross the English Channel. While the Royal Navy would still pose a severe threat to an invasion force, they could not prevent aerial attacks on Britain's ports, industries or people. And the ships were vulnerable to German air attack. In preparation, the Luftwaffe moved three air armies to newly captured bases spread in an arc from Normandy through northern France to Belgium and Holland. Between them, they could muster some 2,800 aircraft, of which two-thirds were bombers. They would also be able to draw on large reserves in Germany. Arguably, the Germans' most successful aircraft during the Blitzkrieg had been the Junkers Ju-88H Stuka. Designed as a dive bomber, its impact, both militarily and psychologically, had been decisive. Its distinctive cranked wing and ability to attack in a near vertical dive, accompanied by the screaming siren mounted in its undercarriage, is one of the most enduring images of the Blitzkrieg. During the early campaigns, the Stuka proved very effective at breaking open defences, enabling the fast-moving land forces to move in and exploit the gaps. They were also very effective at terrorising fleeing civilians and refugees by driving them onto roads to obstruct the movements of opposition forces. One of its most novel design features were its pull-up dive brakes which deployed automatically once the bomb was released, even if the pilot blacked out from the high acceleration. While the Germans enjoyed total air superiority, the Stukas were very effective. But once up against superior fighters, like the Spitfire and Hurrican, they became very vulnerable especially once they were in a dive. As a result, they were soon withdrawn. Like the Stuka, the Dornier 17 had proved very effective as a bomber during the Polish campaign. 
but it was slow and its combat range was just 200 miles. As a result, its career during the Battle of Britain was short-lived and mainly limited to attacking shipping in the English Channel. It was called the Flying Pencil due to its slender fuselage and pilots loved its manoeuvrability. But these qualities were gradually eroded by the addition of extra crew and machine guns, all of which added weight. It also had air-cooled BMW radial engines, which meant there was no vulnerable cooling system that could be disabled during a fighter attack. The Junkers Ju-88 was possibly Germany's best aircraft of the Second World War, or at least its most flexible. Like the British de Havilland Mosquito, with which it is often compared, the Ju-88 was a successful bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. It also proved to be a very effective night fighter, and when fitted with dive brakes, a dive bomber as well. JU-88s were deployed against British shipping from the very outset of the war. Their relatively high speed also made them well suited to low-level ground attack against airfields. But despite their speed and range, they were vulnerable. And as a proportion of numbers deployed, more JU-88s were lost than any other German aircraft during the Battle of Britain. The Heinkel HE-111 was the mainstay of the German bomber force throughout the Second World War. Although it began life as a civilian transport, this was simply a way of getting around the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles, which forbade Germany to build an air force. The Heinkel was easily converted to a bomber in time for the start of the Polish campaign in 1939. As a medium bomber, it could carry up to 10,000 pounds of bombs, both internally and mounted on racks under the wings. Again, it performed well in the early campaigns of the war, but during the Battle of Britain, its light defensive armament, relatively low speed and poor manoeuvrability left it vulnerable to the spitfires and hurricanes of RAF fighter command. But the Heinkel could take a lot of battle damage and still stay airborne. Although the Luftwaffe bombers perform well during the Polish campaign, once they came up against a modern, well-equipped air force like the RAF, their shortcomings were exposed. They were conceived during the 1930s as part of a force to fight battles on the continental mainland. Their bomb bays were quite small, and so the only way they could carry more bombs was to mount them on racks under the wings. As a result, they could not fly as fast or as far. They were also likely armed with defensive machine guns. None of these things were problems when up against lesser opposition, but once they came up against the RAF, there was no time to develop the aircraft. The solution was to send them to their targets with a fighter escort. The Messerschmitt BF-110 was a twin-engine heavy fighter with a crew of two. Like the bombers it was supposed to escort, the BF-110 proved very successful in the early campaigns of the war. But its lack of manoeuvrability when it came up against Spitfires and Hurricanes made it very vulnerable. As losses mounted, many units were withdrawn early from the battle. Others found themselves being escorted into battle by another fighter, the Messerschmitt BF-109. 
Although the BF-109 was conceived during the early 1930s, it was one of the first truly modern fighters of the era. The concept was simple, a powerful V-12 liquid-cooled engine installed in as light an airframe as possible. Its construction featured an all-metal monocoque and a closed canopy, as well as a retractable undercarriage. Having seen service during the Spanish Civil War, it continued to be competitive against Allied fighters right up to the end of the Second World War. Although it had been conceived as an interceptor, during the Battle of Britain, its main role was as a fighter escort for the bombers, as they were incapable of defending themselves. Being tied to the bombers meant that by the time the formations had formed up from their widely dispersed airfields, the fighters were already low on endurance by the time they reached the British coast. As a result, they were not as effective as they could have been in taking on the RAF's fighters. Waiting for them were the young pilots of RAF Fighter Command. The lull that followed the evacuation of Dunkirk enabled the RAF to continue its preparations unimpeded by operational demands. By mid-July, 640 fighters were available for Britain's defence, just a quarter of the size of the German force threatening them. Some of the fighters were almost obsolete, like the small number of Gloucester Gladiator biplanes. Two Gladiator squadrons had gone to France, but by July 1940, almost all had been replaced by the more modern Spitfires and Hurricanes. Another aircraft to be quickly withdrawn from frontline duties was the Bolton Paul Defiant. Unlike the Gladiator, the Defiant was a new aircraft that simply failed to live up to expectations as events and requirements had changed by the time it was ready for operations. The original intention was for the Defiant to fly standing defensive patrols and to shoot down bombers. But it took so long to get the Defiant into production that it ended up being used as a fighter interceptor. It was far too heavy and unmanoeuvrable for this role. As a result, losses were extremely high and the type was quickly withdrawn before being redeployed in the night fighter role. The RAF also had twin-engine Bristol Bowfighters and Blenheims. The Bowfighter was used as an anti-shipping fighter but was also very effective as a night fighter when fitted with a newly developed intercept radar system. Blenheims were used as both bombers and fighters. Many of the early bombing raids were carried out by Blenheim squadrons in broad daylight at great cost to the crews. A fighter version was developed with an additional four machine guns mounted in a pack on the underside of the fuselage. But they made easy targets for the more highly manoeuvrable single-engine fighters that they came up against. As a result, they were withdrawn and redeployed as night fighters. But the RAF's defence of Britain during the Battle of Britain was dominated by the partnership of the Spitfire and Hurricane. The Hurricane's role was to try and get amongst the bombers, as it was a very stable gun platform. Its thick wings housed a battery of eight machine guns. It could also withstand a lot of battle damage, as it used a traditional construction of a frame covered by a metal and fabric skin. As long as no control wires were severed, bullets simply passed through the aircraft, which also made it a lot easier to repair. Although the Hurricane was slower in the climb than the Messerschmitt Bf 109, four-fifths of all kills between July and October were credited to Hurricane pilots. 
If the Hurricane was a more traditionally built aircraft, then the Spitfire was a groundbreaking design. Based around an all-metal monocoque using newly developed alloys, the Spitfire was a thoroughbred developed from Supermarine's long heritage of building successful racing aircraft. Its main role was to try and draw the fighter escorts away from the bombers so that the Hurricanes could get to work. In this role, the Spitfire was a formidable opponent. Both Spitfires and Hurricanes carried eight .303 machine guns. This was a fairly light machine gun, and so in order to ensure that they could cause the maximum amount of damage, they were harmonized to converge at a range of about 400 meters. Many pilots felt that this was unsuitable for dogfighting, as they had to get in much closer in order to fire with accuracy. And so they had their guns reset to converge as close as 110 meters. Britain's air defense depended principally on RAF fighter command. Although Bomber Command and Coastal Command would both make a significant contribution to the battle by attacking the German invasion preparations and airfields across the Channel, and the Army's anti-aircraft guns would inflict losses on the raiders, it was the pilots of Fighter Command under Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding who would meet the Luftwaffe head-on. Fighter Command was split geographically into four groups, 11 group in the southeast, commanded by New Zealander Air Vice Marshal Sir Keith Park, would bear the brunt of the attacks. Many RAF squadrons had taken heavy losses in the fighting of the continent, and Fighter Command now stood at around 640 aircraft and 1,300 pilots. This number would be reinforced through the course of the battle by volunteers from other RAF commands, the fleet air arm, by pilots from overseas and by replacements passing out of the training schools. Even so, Dowding's greatest concern was to be the struggle to keep enough pilots in the front line as casualties and fatigue took their toll. Nearly 3,000 aircrew would serve with fighter command in the course of the battle, of whom nearly 600, around 20%, were from the British Dominions and occupied European or neutral countries. However, the fighters were part of a highly effective and advanced command and control system that was to give the RAF a distinct advantage. At various levels in the command structure, Operations rooms gathered and collated information gleaned from the newly invented radar sites that looked out from Britain's coastline and could detect formations as they built up over France and Belgium. Additional information was fed in from the volunteers who staffed observer corps posts further inland. Solo Jim Crow sorties helped identify formations from aircraft in the air. All this information provided an almost real-time picture of the situation in the skies above. This allowed the commanders to direct their sparse resources towards the points where they were most needed, rather than wasting effort guarding empty skies. Although both the German Navy and Luftwaffe had prepared different plans for the invasion, it was clear that the Luftwaffe had to defeat the RAF. It had already defeated the air forces of Poland, the Netherlands, Belgium and France, and so confidence was sky high. Their commander, Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, was as optimistic as his men and predicted that victory could take just a few days. The Battle of Britain roughly divides into four phases. The first phase began on July the 10th. 
The Luftwaffe had already been attacking shipping in the English Channel for some weeks. But this campaign was now stepped up. The objectives were to sever Britain's supply lines and draw fighter command into battle over the Channel, where they could be destroyed by the Luftwaffe's superior numbers. Although the Germans knew about Britain's radar system, they did not have a clear idea just how important the radar stations were to Britain's defence. The stations along the south coast were repeatedly attacked and some of them were very badly damaged. The Stukas were used widely in these attacks, but because they were so vulnerable to Spitfires and Hurricanes, they were withdrawn by mid-August, having taken heavy losses. Throughout this phase, the Luftwaffe was probing British defences in an attempt to find weaknesses before mounting a major assault to exploit them. By the beginning of August, German invasion forces and barges were being assembled in ports and harbours along the French coast. The raids against the south coast of England increased in size and number. They believed they had destroyed Britain's early warning radar system and that the coastal towns had been sufficiently softened up by bombing and bombardment by the enormous guns that had been drawn up along the French coast. The Luftwaffe now began the next stage of their plan, the destruction of the RAF. Codenamed Adlertag, or Eagle Day, by the German High Command, operations were to begin on August the 13th. The targets were fighter command airfields of 11 Group, protecting southeast England. To put pressure on British defences, high and low level raids were launched against multiple targets. Although battered, the radar stations were still working. But inevitably, some of the low-level raids got through, and sometimes the first warning pilots had of an incoming raid were Dornier DO-17s or JU-88s streaking over their airfields, dropping their bombs. Some even got away without any form of interception. The pressure on fighter command grew as the raids continued into September. The situation in 11 Group became desperate. Small civilian airfields were used as an emergency, as many RAF stations were badly damaged. Although Spitfires and Hurricanes could easily take off from grass fields, the maintenance and spare supply situation became dangerously stretched. Ground crews working in the open suffered heavy casualties from the raids, and many maintenance facilities were destroyed in the bombing. Despite this, the crews kept the fighters as combat ready as possible, winning the battle on the ground as the pilots were in the air. The situation got so bad, it was even suggested that the fighters should be pulled back north of the Thames. But Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding and 11 Group Commander Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park knew that this was exactly what the Germans wanted, effectively giving them air superiority over the intended invasion area. So the 11 Group Squadron stayed and fought for their lives. For the young pilots of Fighter Command, it was exhausting work. Their days usually began just before dawn. A lorry would ferry them round to their aircraft, waiting in their dispersal areas. Riggers, armourers and fitters would be preparing the aircraft, refuelling, loading ammunition, making any last-minute repairs to damage inflicted the day before. Then it was a case of waiting to see what the day might bring. Pilots occupied themselves as best they could, not far from their aircraft. Each squadron was led by a squadron leader, 
a squadron was subdivided into two flights, A and B flight, each led by a flight lieutenant. Each flight was subdivided into three sections of three aircraft, red, green and yellow. One section was always held in readiness at the dispersal, while the others went for 20-minute meal breaks, although these were often no more than snacks. As the sun rose, so did the tension. A click of the tannoy might herald the arrival of a cup of tea, or more likely, the order to scramble. By the time the pilots had sprinted to their waiting machines, the fitters had connected the starter battery to the mighty V-12 Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Parachutes were often placed on the end of the wing, ready for the pilot. Once in the cockpit, it was a case of wait for instructions of the enemy's height, bearing and numbers before pushing the throttle forward to taxi out onto the runway. Visibility while taxiing both Spitfires and Hurricanes was limited and so pilots had to zigzag their way to the runway. On a grass airfield, a squadron could take off all at the same time. Once airborne, the four sections would form up in V-shaped formations of three aircraft called VIX. The tactic had been devised in the pre-war years when it was believed that they would be fighting squadrons of bombers. The VIX formation was a good way of concentrating the squadron's firepower, but it meant that only the leader was looking out for the enemy, as the rest were concentrating on flying in tight formation. Later during the battle, they began to fly in pairs of loose groupings of four, which gave the pilots greater combat flexibility. Height and speed were the two main elements for success in air combat. Sometimes the pilots also had the advantage of surprise. But that would not last long. As the Hurricanes went for the bombers, the Spitfires would take on the escorting Messerschmitts. Actual combat lasted just a few seconds. The pilots had to get in close and fire short bursts. In an instant, the sky would be filled with aircraft, twisting and turning like some deadly ballet. On the ground, the eyes of the civilians would look upwards as intricate networks of vapour trails began to fill the summer sky. Occasionally, a smudge of black smoke would smear its way downwards, another casualty of the battle. Just as quickly as it started, the combat would end and the sky cleared. The RAF pilots would head back to their airfields in ones and twos, others limped back as best they could. Once landed, they would be debriefed before returning to their dispersal huts, while the ground crews quickly got their aircraft ready to start the whole grim cycle over again. But many didn't make it back. For those German crews who managed to bail out, four long years of prison camp awaited them. Occasionally, even RF pilots had to run the gauntlet of an angry civilian reception committee until they could prove their identities. But more often than not, it was down to the local pub to be feted as a hero before a car arrived to take them back to their squadrons. At the start of the battle, the intention was to give each pilot a rest day after six days of being on readiness. The reality was that as the summer wore on and casualties mounted, the opportunities for rest days became fewer and farther between. As fatigue set in and the raids continued their relentless pace, Fighter Command was reaching breaking point. Even though the aircraft factories had been bombed, new aircraft were soon appearing on airfields to replace those lost or beyond repair. But pilots took longer to train. In one week by mid-August, around 300 aircraft were delivered, but only 200 pilots arrived in the same period. There was little time to spare getting the newly arrived pilots combat ready, which is why so many became the first casualties. Although September the 15th is generally recognised as the day when the battle reached its crescendo, 
Records show that Sunday the 18th of August was the hardest fought day. On this day, the Luftwaffe tried its hardest to smash the RAF's fighter airfields by launching 970 sorties involving some 2,200 crew. In defence, RAF fighters flew 927 sorties involving 600 crew. In the fighting that followed, the RAF and the Royal Navy's Fleet Air Arm lost 68 aircraft, including 31 during air combat. 22 pilots were either killed or wounded badly enough that they would not take any further part in the battle. The Luftwaffe lost at least 69 aircraft, with 134 crew either killed or captured, and a further 25 returning to their bases as wounded. The Luftwaffe was slowly bleeding to death in its attempt to crush the RAF. To keep up the pressure, the Germans began night raids to try and stop the defenders repairing damage overnight. But on one night raid, some aircraft bombed civilian areas of London by mistake. A mistake which was to become a crucial turning point in the battle. Hitler had specifically banned bombing the civilian population, as he still hoped that once they realised the hopelessness of their situation, the British would sue for a negotiated peace. German commanders also recognised that widespread civilian casualties would only stiffen British resolve to fight on. In reply to this accidental attack, RAF Bomber Command bombed Berlin. Just when it seemed that the country and fighter command in particular couldn't fight for another day, the Germans changed their tactics. Hitler was enraged by the attack on Berlin and because it seemed that the attacks on airfields were not destroying enough RAF fighters, he ordered a change of targets. By attacking cities and industrial centres, the Germans hoped to break British morale. They also hoped that RAF fighters would gather in force around the cities to protect them, which would make it easier for the Luftwaffe to shoot them down in the numbers required to establish air superiority. The first raid came on Saturday, September the 7th, Black Saturday. Their target, London Docks. Then, every night except for one, London was attacked through to mid-October. Other cities followed. On the night of November the 14th and 15th, Coventry was pounded for 12 hours, killing more than 560 people. The city was devastated and to Coventrate passed into the German lexicon to describe the intense destruction they intended to subject other British cities to. But the Germans had made a fatal error of judgement. British morale may have wobbled briefly but it did not collapse and the factory soon began working again. It also gave 11 Group the respite it needed to rebuild its battered squadrons and radar sites. The German raids now came within range of 12 Group, who were able to put their big wing theories to the test. At the height of the Battle of Britain, there was not enough time to get the number of aircraft into the air that the big wing tactics needed to be successful. It was tried on several occasions, but with limited success. Now that British controllers knew their targets were London and the industrial centres, there was enough time to get the aircraft into the air and ready for the oncoming bombers. Height 15 thousand, coming in on a bearing of 100. Target. The appearance of up to five squadrons of Spitfires and Hurricanes came as a shock to the German crews who had been told by their intelligence officers that fighter command had been virtually wiped out. Their morale began to suffer. Target 
September the 15th marked the beginning of the end of the Battle of Britain. Although not as large as some of the earlier raids, the German bomber crews were met by swarms of Spitfires and Hurricanes from a reinvigorated fighter command. The Germans lost around 60 aircraft, fighter command 26. The Luftwaffe now realized that it had miscalculated and it became increasingly clear that they could not win the air superiority that they needed. Two days later, Hitler suspended Operation Sea Lion indefinitely. As the long hot summer ran into October and the days became shorter, the German daylight bomber losses began to mount. As a result, they resorted to night bombing while scaling back the daylight raids. The damage they caused to Britain's cities was enormous and thousands of civilians died. Now the entire British population was fighting the Battle of Britain. As the night raids intensified, the RAF had started to develop night fighters equipped with radar which could tackle the problem. The first AI, or Airborne Intercept, radar sets were being fitted to Blenheims, Defiance and Bow Fighters and proved increasingly effective as the equipment developed and operational experience increased. During the day, German fighters, mostly Messerschmitt 109s and occasionally Messerschmitt 110s, were sent over carrying bombs in small and large-scale raids. These were mostly nuisance raids aimed at engaging the RAF fighters and disrupting defensive operations over the southeast. But these raids did stretch the defenders still further, as they were already tired from the night attacks. The German raiders flew fast and high and were difficult to intercept. The warnings from the radar stations were not long enough to allow a Spitfire to climb to the height that was needed from the ground. So the RAF had regular patrols between 15,000 and 20,000 feet. This was a costly and inefficient use of the aircraft and pilots, exactly the situation the control system had helped to avoid during the early phases of the battle. But German losses began to increase. The weather also began to worsen, and the raid stopped in late October. During late October, towns around the East Kent coast were also attacked by aircraft from the Italian Air Force. Italy entered the war on the side of the Germans in June 1940. Their leader, Benito Mussolini, not wanting to lose out on the spoils of what seemed like certain victory, offered to send an expeditionary force of aircraft to assist the Luftwaffe. Initially, Hitler declined the offer and then changed his mind. As a result, the Italians found themselves stationed in Belgium. The force included both fighters and bombers. For example, the G50 Freccia, or Arrow, was Italy's first all-metal monoplane fighter. Although it was very manoeuvrable, it had no radio and was lightly armed with only two machine guns, and so they were not very effective. It also had an open cockpit, which was fine for the Mediterranean theatre, but in the cold autumn skies of northwest Europe, the pilots had a miserable time. The aircraft also had limited range and were based too far from their targets to be little more than a nuisance. By April 1941, the last units had been withdrawn. By then, Germany was preparing to attack Russia, so Operation Sea Lion was cancelled indefinitely and eventually abandoned altogether. The Battle of Britain was over. 
The battle was the first to be decided purely in the air, and the first real test of air power as a defensive and offensive weapon. And yet it never really ended, so much as petered out. Both sides took heavy casualties during the Battle of Britain. The Luftwaffe lost nearly 1,900 aircraft and more than 2,500 aircrew killed. Fighter Command had lost 544 pilots killed, about one in six of those who fought. Bomber and Coastal Commands had also taken heavy losses, but their attacks on German airfields, invasion barges, supply dumps and later cities had severely hampered preparations for Operation Sea Lion. By the 21st of September, some 214 barges had been sunk or damaged, amounting to nearly 10% of the total number gathered for the invasion, although at a punishing cost. On several occasions, attacking formations suffered 100% casualties, and between them, bomber and coastal commands would lose nearly 1,000 aircrew. By the 31st of October, the British were confident that there would be no invasion in 1940. The Blitz, however, continued unabated until May 1941, and would eventually result in nearly 40,000 civilian deaths. Nevertheless, the battle for control of the air over Britain had been decisively won by the RAF. Victory in the battle not only saved the United Kingdom from invasion, but also in the long term saved Europe too. Nazi Germany's plans to impose its will on Europe was thwarted for the first time through threat or military might, and its much vaunted Luftwaffe had, for the first time, tasted defeat in battle. Britain would remain as a bastion of freedom and hope off the coast of occupied Europe. When Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, Britain was able to send the armaments and supplies that would prove vital as Russia teetered on the edge of defeat for the first 18 months. When the United States of America entered the war in December 1941, the British Isles acted as a stronghold and launching pad from which Britain and her allies could take the war back to Germany initially through the combined bomber offensive and later as the springboard for Allied armies to re-enter the continent and begin the liberation of Western Europe. Today, the RAF Battle of Britain Memorial Flight operates as a flying memorial to one of the service's proudest battle honours. The acquisition of an Avro Lancaster bomber in 1973 enabled the flight to expand this role to include Bomber Command. The flight was formed in 1957 at Biggin Hill as the historic aircraft flight. But it was usually referred to as the Battle of Britain flight and the name was duly changed. Today, the flight operates six Spitfires and two Hurricanes. Their appearance at any event is always a highlight. One of the Spitfires, a Mark II, is not only a genuine Battle of Britain survivor, but is indeed the only flying Spitfire survivor of the battle. It was delivered to No. 603, City of Edinburgh Squadron, at Hornchurch in October 1940. On October 25, 1940, its pilot had to make a forced landing after being damaged in combat with a Messerschmitt 109. 
Following repairs, it rejoined operations in sweeps across France as fighter command went on the offensive in the summer of 1941. Increasing values have led to more Spitfires being restored to an airworthy condition. But hurricanes are much rarer. The BBMF has two, but the only Battle of Britain veteran is in private hands. At the 2005 Biggin Hill Airfare, this newly restored hurricane made its first public appearance, having been brought back from India more or less as a wreck. During the Battle of Britain, pilots flying this hurricane shot down five enemy aircraft. To see this hurricane and Mark II Spitfire together was a stirring spectacle for both young and old. The Battle of Britain was fought many years ago and the men who flew their machines into the relentless onslaught are becoming fewer and fewer. But the sound of the Merlin engine and the sight of a Spitfire or Hurricane soaring across the sky will serve as a fitting and powerful tribute to their achievement and sacrifice.